Welcome and thank you for tuning in to A Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM with Ryan, Matt, Emily, Aminder, Alicia, and Matthew. We are third-year BSN students at Vancouver Island University in Nanaimo, BC. We're working to demystify health issues affecting our community, bringing you evidence-based information about our health care. This information is for educational purposes only and does not replace the advice of your primary health care provider. We would like to start our show by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Snunamo people. Hello and good morning. I am Matthew Bertolucci. I am Amindar Kaur. And you are listening to A Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. Today we are discussing the very important topic of caregiver burnout. And later in the episode, we will talk about survivor's guilt. These conditions affect very many in our society, but it is talked about so little. To begin, everyone knows someone who cares for someone else, whether it's an elderly parent, a sick loved one, or children. We see these people work to make their loved one's lives as comfortable as possible. But here's the thing. These caregivers are usually overworked and don't spend any time focusing on themselves. We see this in an exhausted new mother caring for her baby or in an elderly care person caring for their spouse. So the people that are affected by this are wide ranging. So let's cover the exact definition of caregiver burnout as described by the Cleveland Kinelinic. So caregiver burnout is a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion. Stressed caregivers may experience fatigue, anxiety, and depression. Unfortunately, many caregivers also feel guilty if they spend time on themselves rather than on their ill or elderly loved ones. Caregivers who are burned out may experience fatigue, stress, anxiety, and depression. So what are the factors that lead to caregiver burnout? So as mentioned, the caregiver is often so busy and consumed that they neglect their own needs and become both emotionally and physically drained. Furthermore, caring for a loved one with a chronic illness can seem like a never-ending task leading to states of being overwhelmed and fatigue, hopelessness, and burnout. However, other factors lead to burnout as well. One of these is the role confusion. Here, the caregiver has a hard time separating themselves from the role of caring and the role of spouse, love, child, or a friend. As well, unrealistic expectations that the care will be a positive effect only to see their loved ones further decline with a degenerative disease. A lack of control is what many caregivers suffer from, where they may be in a poor financial or resource position to influence the care of their loved one, leading to other people to control their personal life. This can become very draining and demoralizing. Additionally, some caregivers put unreasonable demands upon themselves, where for them to maintain their dignity, they have to provide the care on their own. This leads to burnout and leads to other people needing to get involved, creating a feeling of low self-esteem, leading to depression. In the worst case scenario, many caregivers do not recognize that they are suffering letting themselves get to a point where they cannot function and become sick themselves. So let's talk about the symptoms of caregiver burnout. And as outlined by the Cleveland Clinic, these symptoms are similar to stress and depression. Things like withdrawing from friends, family, and other loved ones, losing interest in activities previously enjoyed, per person feeling irritable, hopeless, and helpless in life, changes in appetite and weight, insomnia or hypersomnia, so it's not sleeping enough or sleeping too much, getting sick more often, suicidal ideation, or in some worst case scenarios, homicidal ideation to the person they're caring for because emotional and physical exhaustion. Exactly. According to the Mayo Clinic, preventing caregiver burnout begins with finding someone you trust to talk with about your feelings and frustrations. By talking to them, they can help help you set realistic goals and accept that you may need help with caregiving. As well, local organizations or places of worship may provide support for caregivers in these situations. These organizations may also provide respite care to allow the caregiver to have a time away from the patient. 
Respite Care provides temporary break for caregivers. This can range from a few hours of in-home care to a short stay in a nursing home or assisted living. I also think connecting with trusted people will be helpful as you become realistic about your loved one's disease. Especially, it is a progressive disease such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. It is important to know that there will come a time when the patient requires support services or assistance living outside of your family home. On top of all this, it is vital to take care of yourself and not center your whole life around caring for someone else. Setting aside time for yourself, even if it's just an hour or two, can go a long way in helping your physical and mental health. Remember, taking care of yourself is an absolute necessity for caregivers. Remember, self-care is not selfish. It, is, it allows you to give your loved ones the best of yourself, not what is left of yourself. It is important to know yourself and your limits when to do the best. It is important to know yourself and your limits and when to do the best self-care and take a break from the person you are caring for. A good way to do self-care is, is, for example, about 30 minutes of exercise throughout the day. This doesn't have to be a full-blown workout, going to the gym and things like that. This can be a, something as simple as taking a brisk walk around the neighborhood during the day. This will also give you time to get some good old sunshine, boosting your vitamin D levels in your body. Did you know that vitamin D helps calcium strengthen your bones and it boosts your immune system, making your body more resilient in life and against disease? On top of that, it helps to facilitate increased vitamin D in your body, helps to facilitate increased production of serotonin in your body. And cope better. Yes, and it helps improve your brain and mental health function. Mm -hmm. Taking omega-3 fatty acids help decrease inflammation in your body as well. Your brain in particular causes the release of serotonin, improving your mood and cognitive function. And we got this information also from Mayo Clinic. Absolutely, yes. The Mayo Clinic is such a great source of information. Yeah, it and provides other a lot of information. And other healthcare institutions, Cleveland Clinic as well, mm -hmm. Toronto General Hospital. Oh yeah. Um, even going on major international organizations like the World Health Organization can provide valuable information and also government sources as well, I including agree. our local Island Health has mm -hmm. great resources on their website. Yeah, part of self-care is including help in your life from like other people or joining a sport groups also increases your so socialization. Okay. This will improve your mood. This will improve your mood and talking with others will help you put your personal issues into, pers into perspective as well. As well, sharing your feelings and experiences with others in the same situation can help you manage stress, locate helpful resources, and reduce feelings of frustration and isolation. This is why it's so important to include respite care in your home and into your life. As don't be afraid to ask for help. And that is something I can't stress enough. Like asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Asking for help is a sign of courage. Yeah. That you're willing to, like it helps boost yourself, that you value yourself so much that you're willing to allow other people to come into your life and include other people in your life to help you. Asking for help, I think, is not a sign of weakness. As we said last time too, it's a sign of strength. It's a sign of courage. Absolutely. Furthermore, this support can help you have peace of mind leading a better sleep which will improve your capacity to handle stress. It is very important to talk to a professional when you're feeling overwhelmed. Most therapists, social workers, and clergy members are trained to counsel individuals dealing with a wide range of personal issues, both emotional and physical. Absolutely. So going to things like church, and I think this is why like, a lot of times people who go to places of worship are so much more content in life because it's not just the fact that they're including themselves in something that's greater than themselves a yeah. religion but they're also connecting themselves with other people in that faith and it's that social connection that really provides a lot of meaning in their life and you know even something as simple as talking to people goes such a long way like if you think about when you're having a hard time and you try to internalize it and you just try not to tell anybody it can put a huge burden on you and you feel like very terrible about it right yeah. but as soon as you go and sit down and talk with someone and you have a chat with someone and you tell them what you're feeling, it can go such a long way this way in helping you feel better and helping you cope. And I think that's something that we don't do enough in our society because like, it's just, 
you know, in our society, I think is very individualistically based in the sense that people don't want to, they feel like if they share their personal life or their struggles with other people, they feel like they're becoming a burden on that person. That's right. But most of the time, people are much more receptive to these things than you would realize. Yeah, I feel like sometimes we keep so many things to ourselves and like keep on making assumptions. I, I feel like we should always talk it out, share it with our people, our friends, our trusted ones. We always come to a solution. If we trust them, just talk it out. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, also accepting your feelings, having having negative feelings such as frustration or anger about your responsibilities or the person for whom you're caring is normal. It does not mean you're a bad person or a bad caregiver. Absolutely. And like when it comes to these kinds of things, like I think, you know, I've seen caregiver burned out in my own family with my uh, grandmother caring for my grandfather as he started to decline physically when he got into his late 80s. And she was, you know, she was very proud and she didn't want to let anybody into, you know, she was, she felt like it would be something that would be a burden on her. It would hurt her self-esteem and her pride if she allowed other people to come in and help. And as much as we wanted to include support services and we talked about nursing homes and things like that. She would refuse all that because, like, you know, I think it's very hard for people as they get older because they've been so independent throughout their life and able to look after themselves all their life that they are they go into, like, a kind of a state of denial as they get older. You know, they, they become, like, I should be able to do what I've done my entire life and look after m- my family, care for my loved ones, and be okay with myself as well. But the thing is, as you're getting older... And this is such a hard reality of life, but it's something we have to work through and chat with people about, right? Yeah. Is to connect with them and stress, like, no, if you're bringing people into your life, this is just a fact of life and that you are not less of a person because other people are coming to help you. Other people are coming to help you because you have built those connections throughout your life. You built those connections with your family. You built those connections with your children. So when they're coming to help you, Think of that as a success of your life. Think of that as something like, these are people that care for me because I've done such a fantastic job in my life supporting my family that now when I'm in the state of need, as my spouse is getting older, as I'm getting older, that is a success that these people are here to help me. And that should be something that should make you proud. That should be something that should make you have dignity and pride in yourself. I have goosebumps listening to it. That is something that I think you need that is so important. I also go to interview some people at Global Citizen Week the other day um, on Thursday. Um, Those people, they were like, they were not comfortable if I would record them. So, and they did not want me to share their names. So keeping their privacy by not sharing their names or, uh, I go to ask them some questions about um, burnout. Most of them were like immigrants like how they feel um two of two of them had the same kind of experience that how they feel um they feel like cultural differences they miss their family and above all that they find like all those new assignments everything their assignment structure is way different than their home country and here is like totally different um they have to deal with so much and in the end they feel like they're burning out from all that they start to feel like they're lonely and to give them some coping strategies, um, um, I gave some like coping strategy. The ones we just discussed, like going on going on a walk, um, getting into a bubble bath, or like listening to music, doing some workout. They're like, yeah, we do that, but sometimes we don't feel like doing it because we feel we are very lonely. So their focus was like mainly on loneliness. So um, I gave the answer of what I thought was best to me at that point, but I feel like I want to share. So there are three things you should always remember when you feel like you're all by yourself or you're alone. And number one is, it is okay to be alone. It is okay to accept that you're all by yourself. Saying I am lonely, it's fine. So that was number one. Number two is resenting it. You must never resent that you're alone. Number three, find happiness in your own loneliness. For example, 
going out on a walk enjoy the beauty outside enjoying um looking at the leaves looking at the ocean beach water waves everything try to find happiness even in small little things because those things even matter a lot absolutely like heading down to like you know down to the harbor going down and walking yeah. along the water you know it's like that old saying like when you know i think like back in the old days when people got sick or something like that they would or they were feeling like run down they would go to the seaside and they would like yeah, yeah. I was. I remember reading that in like books and stuff like that, where people would go. They would go down to the seaside when they were sick. It's something about being close to the water, close to the ocean, being outside I in the sunshine. I call it sometimes like me time. You know, yeah. like whenever I'm like with so many people, or like I feel like I enjoy m- my time best when I'm by myself. Sometimes I like want to go on a walk on my own. I like to go to the beach, sit there, like enjoy all the water, the cold breeze. I think it's so beautiful. I don't know why people think it's it's a bad thing. No, it's absolutely an important thing and such a beautiful thing that people can do that. And, you know, we live in such a beautiful part of the world, too, here on the Pacific Northwest. We've got so many great places to go. And, like, walking around in the woods and stuff like that, going for trail hikes Mm -hmm. and so much of the outdoor activities. Exactly. These small little tiny things can make a huge difference if we find happiness in all yeah. those things. Connecting yourself with support groups that do those activities, right? Mm-hmm. If you're tuning in right now, we are on CHLY 101.7 FM, a sound constitution. I am Aminder. I am Matthew. We are third year nursing student from Vancouver Island University. And today we are discussing burnout, caregiver burnout, as well as survivor's guilt. Absolutely. I hope you enjoy the show today and find it helpful. Survivor's guilt is something that people experience when they survived a life-threatening situation while others have not. It is commonly seen in people who have survived war, a natural disaster, motor vehicle accidents, and even organ transplant recipients. According to Dr. Nancy Sherman, PhD, on Psychology Today article, she describes survivor's guilt as a loop of non-factual thoughts that you could have or should have done something otherwise, though in fact you did nothing wrong. Essentially, people with survivor's guilt feel like they should have done more to help others in the life-threatening situation. But here's the thing. You're not responsible for other people's fate. But unfortunately, guilt is not something we have control over. However, it is normal response to loss. Now, not on, not everyone experiences this, but people with a history of anxiety, depression, and low self-esteem are more prone to it. So let's discuss the symptoms of survivor's guilt. And remember, survivor's guilt is a component to post-traumatic stress disorder, which we'll be talking more in next week's episode. Um, so, symptoms of survivor's guilt. They are having flashbacks. Feeling irritable. Having difficulty sleeping. Feeling immobilized, numb, or disconnected from reality. Being unmotivated. Feeling helpless or hopeless. Um, having an intense sense of fear, experiencing physical t- symptoms such as like headaches, stomach ache. And palpitations. Yeah, as or well. having suicidal thoughts. Yes, and I just want to direct you guys to the Vancouver Island Crisis Line. If you are having suicidal thoughts that number is one triple eight four nine four three triple eight for the vancouver island crisis line that is one triple eight four nine four three triple eight hey aminder do you have any coping strategies for people surviving with uh survivor's guilt living with survivor's guilt giving yourself time to grieve well sometimes considering thinking about who was really responsible if anyone or remember to take care of yourself physically and psychologically. Um, think about think about those who are like close to you are feeling about that situation. Always remind yourself that you were given the gift of survival and feel good about it. Try to be um, be of service to someone or something. Remind yourself that you're not alone. Be patient. Um, share your feelings with those you trust. Try to stick to a daily routine. Consider journaling, generally, sorry, consider journaling your feelings and get professional help as needed. Absolutely. Those are very good resources um, and activities that you can do to cope 
with survivor's guilt. And again, since survivor's guilt is a component of post-traumatic stress, uh, we'll be going in much more detail in next week's episode about this topic as well. Up next, we'll be having an interview with Pierre Young, MA, BSN, RN. She's a nursing professor at Vancouver Island University's Faculty of Nursing, and she'll be giving her insight into caregiver burnout, as well as resources and coping strategies on how to deal with this condition. All right. Hello and good morning. We're here with the Sound Constitution. I'm Matthew Bertolucci, and I'm being joined by Pierre Young. Uh, she is a nursing professor at Vancouver Island University, and uh, she has an experience and background of geriatrics. Thank you for having me, Matthew. Thank you. Um, so today we're going to be talking about caregiver burnout, which is a very um, important topic that affects so many individuals and families in our community, and so many people have so many questions surrounding it and what to do in these situations. Mm -hmm. So the first question I'd like to start off with is to help understand what we are discussing today. What is caregiver burnout? Well, I like to answer that question with just focusing in, in on the definition of burnout. So if you take a look at the word burnout, it, it means um, that you're straining, you're no longer enjoying, and, and it, whatever you're doing becomes a burden. So that's what burnout means. So if you put the two terms, caregiver, burnout, um, and, and our conversation, we're talking about family caregiver, right? Yeah. So family caregiver burnout then, to me, is about people no longer finding joy or finding their um, caregiving to their family members a rewarding one or a satisfactory one. And, and that is problematic um, in that because so, so much of, um, of care at home is dependent on family caregivers, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that um, with our society, there is a trend about um, people aging in place and um, family caregivers wanting to really promote the um, dignity of the person, and that's why they originally opt out to have to be to give care to the family members. So when family uh, members are burnt out, then that is problematic because you don't have someone else that can step in if you if that individual is a primary caregiver. Right. Yeah. Um, so in our society, um, is there a demographic who makes up the largest group of caregivers? And if so, what are they? Well, again, I'm going to look at your questions backwards, OK? So um, according to the World Health Organization, worldwide, not in BC or Canada, but worldwide, there are 349 million people right now who are estimated to be care dependent. Right. And of those um, people, only 5% of them are children. And 29% of, of them are people who are older. So can you imagine, so you can imagine that um, the 29% of people that requiring care are of older people. So that means that um, the people who are giving care to those older people are, are in much need, right? Um, according to Stats Canada in BC, 28% of our population are family caregivers. Oh, wow. And that 28% is equivalent to 1 million unpaid people as family caregiver. Wow. So if you look at it, if you take into consideration all these stats and all the work that these people are doing, and you think of, wow, they have made such contribution to our healthcare system. What kind of, of training or what kind of preparation are we giving these family caregivers? And that's the exactly. question that I think we need to look at and address, right? right? If you take a look at all these family caregivers, the majority of them are women. Right. 
they are usually wives of a uh, spouse who require care. Right. Many of these individual um, who are caregivers are older themselves. Many of them are 60 yes. onwards. Right. And I think with our society, a lot of, of uh, women now are working outside of homes, right? right? So that means that not only are these um, people older, they're women, they also have additional responsibility outside of their home. So when you add family caregiving onto it, it's a double whammy right. for these individuals. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, what are the care, so for these individuals, um, what are the caregiver burnout warning signs that family members and friends should be mindful of when they're involved in these people's lives? Okay, so before I answer that question, um, I just want to also comment that caregiving in the family setting lasts for a long time. Yeah. Studies have shown that the average um, family caregiver provides care for an average of six years. Oh wow. That's a long time. Yes. Right? So if you look at it over those six years, people change. Look at, you know, you've changed, I've changed in, yeah. in two, three years, right? Absolutely. So if you are a caregiver and you're doing this the same kind of responsibility of giving um, care, um, you get burnout and some of the signs can be, oh, you have way much less energy than you used to. You tend to get colds every time something comes around, you get it. Um, you're constantly exhausted, you're tired, but you can't get to sleep because your mind is racing, thinking of, of all the things you have to do. Um, you don't get satisfaction of, of, you know, of caregiving or, or looking after your loved one. Um, you tend to get irritable or um, impatient with the person that you're providing care to. Right. And there's overall a general feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. Like it's some, right. It feels like that's th it is something so big that you, can't, you don't have any control over. Right. So that's, that's, those are some of the classic warning signs yeah. of burnout. What are proactive measures that people can consider doing to minimize their risk of becoming burned out? There are lots that you can do. Um, I think the underlining thing is to have the family care feel empowered and to develop their resilience. Right. And there are many ways that you can do that. Um, there are tools now that you can actually self-administer to find out, you know, gee, I think I'm getting kind of exhausted or burnout, but is it just my mind? Am I just thinking about it or is it actual facts? So using those tools can provide the um, family caregiver something that is objective for them to measure. And right. that, that is a useful thing for them to, to have, right? Um, the other proactive um, measures that people can do is really understanding that caregiving is a continuum. So just like um, um, any type of, of um, relationship, there are different phases of relationship. So when you're doing a caregiving there, um, studies have talked about that there is the, uh, first of all, is the adapting phase. Right. So you adapt from whatever that your current life is and you fit in that caregiving portion in it and you right. make it work, yep. right? And then gradually, then you move to a, what they call an accepting phase, right. which is accepting that you know, this is going to be ongoing for a little while. It's not just a two or three month yeah. kind of, of endeavor. It's going to be a long time. So you just accept the fact that this is going to be your new norm, right? right. So I think having caregivers understand these that the, of the different phases that they would normally go through right. would, would really help them to, 
to kind of make sense of the emotions, the, um, the psychological um, um, unsettledness that they may have, right. you know, and sometimes they may get frustrated and angry and that can, understanding these faces can help them to understand, oh, this is kind of what I'm going through and it's expected. Right. right? Um, and then, of course, there are lots of things that the caregiver um, can do. It's easier said than done. Um, maintaining their own health, um, putting their their personal relationship as a priority. Right. But when you are in the middle of caregiving and you're exhausted, you're not going to be thinking about going to a movie with with your loved ones. You just you're just so glad that you have this five, 10 minutes yourself, right? right? Exactly. Um, I think one of the things that people can also do is speak up because a lot of caregivers are under the assumption that they're always giving, right? right? And they need to advocate for themselves. Um, uh, there are lots of, uh, um, resources that are out in the community and sometimes the carers are thinking that they are to receive the the um, services but they kind of put themselves in the back seat and and when the services don't match up with the care caregivers um, um, normal part of life then it becomes an additional chore rather than it fitting nicely right. into part of their lives. Right. Yeah. Um, there are lots, there are support groups that uh, caregivers can join. Yeah. Uh, there are lots of community resources that people can call upon. However, um, these community resources, people need to be aware of them before they get started in their yeah. journey, right? So yeah. that's what you mean by being proactive. Because right. when you're in a crisis, you're not going to be spending time on the internet looking for, oh, what support group can I join? Or what are some community resources there are? Right. Yeah. So it's about getting ahead of the curve before. Proactive. Being proactive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, what type of home and community services are available in our health authority and our community that can assist caregivers in providing care for their loved ones? Well, we're so lucky to be here um, in BC and in Canada that I think there are lots of, of, home, um, of community, home and community services that are out there. One that I can think of is the Home and Community Care, um, where it's a subsidized program. So that home, the Home and Community Care provides things such as home support, uh, where there is a um, unregulated care provider comes and help with the individuals with um, activities of daily living. Right. Um, there are also community nursing where uh, a nurse, uh, an RN or LPN would come in and help your loved one to do with dressing changes and that right. will help eliminate some of the needs to, um, you know, go to to appointments to to do that kind of thing so that right. kind of lessen the load a little bit there are also community rehab such as uh, people such as occupational therapists or um, physiotherapists that can help you know telling you what type of equipment would be most useful uh, um, that creates safety for for you and the person you're caring for and then, of course, there are lots of care teams that includes people such as uh, social work, um, uh, uh, pharmacists. And one thing that I don't know if people are aware of is that there is a um, call a nurse line, oh, 811, really? where um, people or family members can call and speak to a nurse oh, wow. or a pharmacist. So then yeah. they can um, ask those questions without having to go outside of their home, right? right. So those are all things that are, are available from the health authority uh, to help support people giving care at home. Um, in addition to that, um, when people are near end of life, they are also um, um, end of life care services, 
uh, that provides physical, psychological, emotional, because those are such trying times sure. uh, and difficult times. And the care, not just the indiv um, individual, but also the caregiver themselves need support, right? And need that time away. And right. hospice is a great example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are also some kind of resources such as um, telehealth, right. uh, Lifeline, um, and TELUS recently has these little buttons that, that people um, can wear when they're in the home setting, oh, yeah. right? So then uh, around the neck, around the neck oh, wow. right? And so, uh, so that just kind of help alleviate some of the, the feeling that the caregiver thinks, oh, I can't even step outside a home. What happened if they fall if I'm not there, right? right. By having those those uh, call alert buttons, then it kind of gives the caregiver a little bit of space that can go out in the garden and, and you know, dig in the dirt for five, ten minutes, right? Yeah. And give sure. that, that much needed space to be themselves. Yeah. yeah. Empowering the individual. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are there criteria for who is eligible to receive home and community support for their family members needing care in the home? Well, yes. Um, the the criteria are, are that you have to be, first of all, a Canadian citizen. Okay. Uh, you have to have lived in BC for at least three months, okay. which I think uh, many people will qualify. Yeah. Um, and the person has to be unable to function independently. So, you know, you and I can't just say, oh, I feel like having <laughs> home support come in or, or someone yeah. do, my, do, do my chores for me. No, no. We, can't, we don't qualify for that, unfortunately. Um, it, if you are, um, your loved one is being discharged from an acute care, like for example, someone have gone into the hospital because they had suffered um, a hip fracture and then when they come out, right. home and community care would be a great resource for that, right, to, right. Help, to help set up. Um, if someone uh, is, uh, can find ways to um, prevent the loved one from um, having to go into admission to a long-term care home. Okay. Uh, so this is what we mean by aging in place, you know. And right. I think older adults want to be in their own homes for as long as possible. But sometimes that can be challenging when caregivers are not able to provide and support them in ways that are needed. Right. Um, before you are eligible um, for the home and community support, uh, uh, a needs assessment needs to be done. Okay. So usually a case manager would come and visit uh, um, the caregiver and, and the loved one at home setting and they would do an assessment to find out how much support they need and how much time they need and then they would create a plan for it. Okay. Yeah. Um, where can people find out about caregiver support groups in their communities? Well, there are lots of places that you can uh, go find support groups because support groups are everywhere but they are sometimes well hidden and sometimes the, um, the, the person who needs the support needs to initiate that call, right? right. So um, right now in um, Central Vancouver Island, there is the Better at Home website where people can go and find non-medical uh, services that can help support their caregiver at home. Um, non-medical services such as uh, home maintenance, repair, friendly visiting, all those things are what Better at Home website would provide. Okay. There's also a um, Family Caregivers of BC group that is very active in um, providing uh, caregiver support line, support group, education, webinars, um, assertiveness skills training, uh, online resources, anything that the caregivers might need. And that's a really, really powerful uh, service group for people to be aware of. Uh, BC211 
is a nonprofit organization that specializes in providing free information and referral, um, anything that has to do with uh, community and social services, you can find that NBC 211 website. In Nanaimo itself, uh, there is the Nanaimo Family Life Association that has uh, a lot of resources in it as well. Um, thank yeah. you, that's good to know. What type of care assistance can be provided to someone needing help in their home? Is there overnight care available? Absolutely. Um, within the community, um, people people can make use of care services outside of their home. For example, there is the adult daycare services, okay. and these are attached to um, a complex care facility or a long-term care facility, for example, at Qantas or um, at Eden's Garden, where um, the, the family caregiver can sign up for a program and they would actually have a bus that would pick up the loved one from your own home and then take your loved one to the adult daycare um, service and they would have you know activities your loved one might be uh, sitting in a nice jacuzzi tub and having a nice soap while it gives you as the family caregiver just time to do things you know like banking or you know going going to the doctor just to, to regards in terms of your own health right so it just kind of gives you a break there's also the caregiver respite or relief service where um, the the person requiring care can stay overnight um, for the weekend or for or five days and that's something that's negotiable with the um, agency and like for example if you if the f if the family caregiver wants to take a break and then go to um, visit their their grandchildren you know right. there is that that option that's available without that constant worry and, and thinking oh my gosh who's going to look after the person needing care um, there are assisted living uh, where the individual can move into assisted living, where the meals are taken care of and, and uh, um, ca you know, care is being provided by, by home support. So, yeah, there are lots of, lots of things that people can do. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, what are the financial considerations that caregivers need to be aware of when seeking assistance with the care of a family member? Well, uh, there is always the publicly subsidized home and community care. Um, and so this cost for getting the service is shared between the Ministry of Health and usually um, most of the services are provided free of charge. Um, there are some portion where it is re the, uh, that you're required to pay and it's called the client rate. And so the client rate is dependent on um, the person's income and um, or, or is a fixed rate. So that's something that the um, community, home and community care service um, can negotiate with, with you on okay. that. Um, and also there is the private pay uh, services. So, that's, so that means that um, if you find that the support you're getting from the publicly subsidized home and community care service is not sufficient or not enough, you can go above and beyond and hire someone on your own. And there are numerous services um, that are available on Central uh, Vancouver Island. I guess to explain that, um, sort of like, you know, if you want to go somewhere, you can either take the city bus, okay. right? So that would be sort of like the publicly subsidized home and community care service. Yeah. Or you can take Uber, right? right? And, and pay for it on your own. And of course you would get there much faster and it's way more convenient. So it depends on, on what your needs are. Yeah. Where should an individual go whom they contact if they're feeding if they are feeding, they are. If they are feeling, they are beginning to experience caregiver burnout. 
they should just go anywhere and everywhere. Right. Probably if their own health provider is the first place to go, you know, having a check-in with their own uh, nurse practitioner or their physician and just expressing that, you know, be, be authentic and be upfront and say, I, I'm feeling exhausted. You know, I'm, I'm getting tired. And, and so just, just sharing that with their, their own health provider. Talk it over, be, 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 um, be clear with the home and community case manager. Set your boundaries, um, saying that, you know, I've been providing care and, and I don't think I can, I can keep it up anymore or, or I'm having trouble adapting or, right. or adjusting. Um, talk to any of the family caregiver support line, call the family um, life association, you know, just just share share how you are um, currently feeling with with someone. Right. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to keep keep to yourself, and I think that's one of the biggest um, thing that people need to to be mindful of. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Because I feel like they are like burdening other people by sharing their personal feelings. Yeah. 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 You need to you need to shift the thinking from from care from bearing the burden to creating a buffer zone for yourself so right. then you can build capacity for yourself. Yes, for sure. Yeah. What policy initiatives should governments and healthcare institutions enact to decrease caregiver burnout in families in our community? Well, I think there are lots of things that could be done, and I'm just so grateful, Matthew, that you are taking time to address this very important issue, because um, family caregiver burnout um, is not something that people would go and chat about in coffee shops, right? right? It is something that people are, sh sometimes they feel guilty, or sometimes they are feeling ashamed and saying, you know, I don't want to share with someone that I'm, I'm not um, uh, capable or I'm not um, ecstatic about caring for my parents. Like it's kind of a shameful thing to, for people to do. So I think that having more research about it and, and pointing out that this is indeed a, um, a, a very essential topic for uh, people to look into is is important. Um, the World Health Organization did a uh, guideline in 2017 where they looked at um, integrated care for older people. And out of that gu guidelines, they made one main recommendation. And the main recommendation is that um, training and support for family members and caregivers should not exclusively be offered only when the need for care is complex or extensive. And that seems to be the current understanding right now. Like, you know, they, they think of, of someone, um, for example, who is giving care of a loved one who doesn't require high technological care and think of, oh, that's simple care. So, so why do we need to support them? But you need to think about the longevity, the endurance of it. Right. right? So, um, and, and keeping it proactive, like you mentioned before, and not wait till someone's in crisis to offer them support and training. I think that's, that's a key thing for policy and uh, healthcare institutions to look at. Right. Um, currently, our community care um, services are somewhat disconnected. Um, so, for example, if someone is going from home support to, um, say, a complex care facility, and then they f uh, fell and then uh, um, have to go to an acute care, like there isn't a continuum of care service that is being offered seamlessly, and that's something that I think uh, we can do better on in terms of. Uh, from the healthcare institution, so more right. connectedness in that way. Um, on top of that, I think that uh, we also need to look at family caregivers as care partners. Right. 
um, and not to leave them out in any care decisions. Because sometimes right now, all the decisions are being made by the healthcare team and then the family caregivers are given almost like a to-do list, you know, and, and not taking it into, into any consideration their own, own lives that they already have. So if the family caregivers is considered as a health partner um, and ask, you know, what kind of needs do you have? What would work well with your own routine uh, that can fit in, then that would, you know, create this, this uh, um, would definitely lessen the burden of family caregiver burnout right. drastically. Patient-specific care. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think also thinking outside the box of our current health delivery is also another thing that I would like to challenge us to look at. Um, a lot of, of older adults now are living in the community um, and also in um, what they call independent living or assisted living. Um, I wonder how we can actually um, be proactive in if we had a nurse practitioner in those um, agencies. Um, so then we can prevent all the chronicity from, um, from um, hastening or, 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 or establish, you know, in the first place, right? right? Um, you know, I think that would that would definitely also lessen the load for caregiver burnout. Right. Um, our society and workplace uh, also needs to recognize that people all over the world are aging. Um, right now, the government of Canada, um, you people qualify for a f family caregiver benefit, and it's for fifteen weeks. And compassionate care for end of life is up to 26 weeks. So 15 weeks is equivalent of four months, right? Wow. And so remember when we first started out, the studies have shown that the average duration of family caregiving is an average of six years. Right. So four months, six yeah. years. Do the math, right? Absolutely. So yeah. I think there's a lot that we can, as a society, can do um, yeah. in that. Um, what would be like constraints or barriers on governments from enacting on it? Would it be like budgetary? Budgetary, prioritization, right. uh, where the health dollars is being uh, prioritized, right? right. So um, looking at healthcare instead of sick care. Exactly. Uh, looking at upstream thinking, yeah. uh, primary health care, right? So yeah. those are all things that, that we need to be more proactive about. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. One thing that I'm really proud of in Nanaimo is that uh, Nanaimo has what they call um, wanting to be an age-friendly city planning. Right. I don't know if you're aware, but there's a, a Nanaimo Seniors Task Force that is looking at um, city planning, community building, um, general house um, housing for older adults. Because right now, a lot of our older adults are living um, individually in their own apartment or own home. If there is a concept or framework where there is more of a community of older adults where they still have their own separate dwelling space, but if they share a common um, kitchen or a common eating area or a common uh, area where they can go and socialize, think of the right. benefits that would be for our older adults. Absolutely. And like how important social connection is with others for brain health yeah. and preventing things like dementia. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that would definitely lessen the, um, the burden of family caregiver. Right? right, because you are no longer everybody caring for their own um, loved one. Maybe we can have uh, a family caregiver taking turns, you know, um, um, being, you know, giving care or, you Absolutely. know, yeah. So there's lots of opportunities there. Just looking yeah. at, at things from a different model, a different framework. Yeah, I have to think out of the box on these complex issues yeah. for sure. And 
Yeah. Yeah. Utilize our resources. Yeah. And then um, Canada, as you know, is a uh, melting pot. And um, again, Stats Canada in 2018 says that ethnically and culturally, Canada is going to be more diverse by 2031, right? right. Like if it's not already. Yeah. So uh, like you mentioned, having that person-centered care, looking at support and um, training for family caregivers that are unique to meet the cultural and ethnic needs of, of different groups. Uh, of population would right. definitely help out as well. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think um, answering your question, I think it all goes back to determinants of health. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, looking at you know what kind of resources individuals have, what kind of strengths we have, what kind of housing, what. Oh yeah. And, and that, that, you know, when you have um, a higher determinants of health, you have more resources to pull from and right. you build that capacity, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, this is all a very complex issue and has to be t tackled in so many different directions mm -hmm. using um, so many different resources and, mm -hmm. and having to find new resources as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah. and talking and talking about it, bringing it out in the forefront, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank Pierre. you. It's right. my pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, this is an interview with Pierre Young, uh, nursing professor at Vancouver Island University, and today we we're talking about caregiver burnout. Thank you for joining us this morning. That was Pierre Young, M.A., B.S.N., R.N. She's a Vancouver Island University nursing professor with experience in healthcare for older adults. If you enjoyed the show today, please like and follow us at CHLY A Sound Constitution on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Next week, we will be talking about post traumatic stress disorder, which is linked to the healthcare issues discussed today. Make sure you take time for yourself today and be kind to one another. Take care. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. We encourage you to reach out to your healthcare provider for more information. As always, check out our Facebook page for additional resources related to today's show. Every episode is uploaded to our YouTube channel if you'd like to hear it again. If there are any topics you'd like us to explore, please contact us at asoundconstitution at gmail.com.